Introduction and Preface of A Brief History of English and American Literature. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kalinda. A Brief History of English and American Literature by Henry A. Beers with introduction and supplementary chapters on the religious and theological literature of Great Britain and the United States by John Fletcher Hurst. Introduction At the request of the publishers, the undersigned has prepared this introduction and two supplementary chapters on the religious and theological literature of Great Britain and the United States. To the preacher in his preparation for the pulpit, and also to the general reader and student of religious history, the pursuit of the study of literature is a necessity. The sermon itself is a part of literature, must have its literary finish and proportions, and should give ample proof of a familiarity with the masterpieces of the English tongue. The world of letters presents to even the casual reader a rich and varied profusion of fascinating and luscious fruit. But to the earnest student who explores with thorough research and sympathetic mind, the intellectual products of countries and times other than his own, the infinite variety so strikingly apparent to the superficial observer resolves itself into a beautiful and harmonious unity. Literature is the record of the struggles and aspirations of man in the boundless universe of thought. As in physics the correlation and conservation of force bind all the material sciences together into one, so in the world of the intellect all the diverse departments of mental life and action find their common bond in literature. Even the signs and formulas of the mathematician and the chemist are but abbreviated forms of writing, the stenography of those exact sciences. The simple chronicles of the analyst, the flowing verses of the poet, clothing his thought with winged words, the abstruse propositions of the philosopher, the smiting protests of the bold reformer, either in church or state, the impassioned appeal of the advocate at the bar of justice, the argument of the legislator on behalf of his measures, the very cry of inarticulate pain of those who suffer under the oppression of cruelty, all have their literature. The minister of the gospel, whose mission is to man in his highest and holiest relations, must know the best that human thought has produced if he would successfully reach and influence the thoughtful and inquiring. Perhaps our best service here will be to suggest a method of pursuing a course of study in literature, both English and American. The following work of Professor Beers touches but lightly and scarcely more than opens these broad and inviting fields, which are ever growing richer and more fascinating. While man continues to think he will weave the fabric of the mental loom into infinitely varied and beautiful designs. In the general outlines of a plan of literary study which is to cover the entire history of English and American literature, the following directions, it is hoped, will be of value. 1. Fix the great landmarks, the general periods, each marked by some towering leader around whom other contemporary writers may be grouped. In Great Britain, the several and successive periods might thus be well designated by such authors as Geoffrey Chaucer or John Wycliffe, Thomas More or Henry Howard, Edmund Spencer or Sir Walter Raleigh, William Shakespeare or Francis Bacon, John Milton or Jeremy Taylor, John Dryden or John Locke, Joseph Addison or Joseph Butler, Samuel Johnson or Oliver Goldsmith, William Cowper or John Wesley, Walter Scott or Samuel Taylor Coleridge, William Wordsworth or Thomas Chalmers, Alfred Tennyson, Thomas Carlyle, or William Makepeace Thackeray. A similar list for American literature would place as leaders in letters Thomas Hooker or Thomas Shepard, Cotton Mather, Jonathan Edwards, Benjamin Franklin, Philip Freneau, Noah Webster or James Kent, James Fenimore Cooper or Washington Irving, Ralph Waldo Emerson or Edward Everett, Joseph Addison Alexander or William Ellery Channing, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, James Russell Lowell, or Nathaniel Hawthorne. The prosecution of the study might be carried on in one or more of several ways, according either to the purpose in view or the tastes of the student. 
attention might profitably be concentrated on the literature of a given period and worked out in detail by taking up individual authors, or by classifying all the writers of the period on the basis of the character of their writings, such as poetry, history, belles lettres, theology, essays, and the like. Again, the literature of a period might be studied with reference to its influence on the religious, commercial, political, or social life of the people among whom it is circulated, or as the result of certain forces which have preceded its production. It is well worth the time and effort to trace the influence of one author upon another, or many others who, while maintaining their individuality, have been either in style or method of production unconsciously molded by their confrères of the pen. The divisions of writers may again be made with reference to their opinions and associations in the different departments of life where they have wrought their active labors, such as in politics, religion, moral reform, or educational questions. The influence of the great writers in the languages of the continent upon the literature of England and America affords another theme of absorbing interest, and has its peculiarly good results in bringing the student into close brotherhood with the fruitful and cultured minds of every land. In fact, the possible applications of the study of literature are so many and varied that the ingenuity of any earnest student may devise such as the exigencies of his own work may require. John F. Hurst, Washington Preface In so brief a history of so rich a literature, the problem is how to get room enough to give not an adequate impression, that is impossible, but any impression at all of the subject. To do this, I have crowded out everything but belles lettres, books in philosophy, history, science, etc., however important in the history of English thought, receive the merest incidental mention, or even no mention at all. Again, I have omitted the literature of the Anglo-Saxon period, which is written in a language nearly as hard for a modern Englishman to read as German is or Dutch. Cædmon and Cinewulf are no more a part of English literature than Virgil and Horace are of Italian. I have also left out the vernacular literature of the Scotch before the time of Burns. Up to the date of the Union, Scotland was a separate kingdom, and its literature had a development independent of the English, though parallel with it. In dividing the history into periods, I have followed with some modifications the divisions made by Mr. Stopford Brooke in his excellent little Primer of English Literature. A short reading course is appended to each chapter. Henry A. Beers End of Introduction and Preface One Chapter One of A Brief History of English and American Literature. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kalinda. A Brief History of English and American Literature by Henry A. Beers. Part One, Chapter One. From the Conquest to Chaucer. 1066 to 1400. The Norman conquest of England in the 11th century made a break in the natural growth of the English language and literature. The Old English or Anglo-Saxon had been a purely Germanic speech, with a complicated grammar and a full set of inflections. For 300 years following the Battle of Hastings, this native tongue was driven from the king's court and the courts of law, from parliament, school, and university. During all this time there were two languages spoken in England. Norman French was the birth tongue of the upper classes, and English of the lower. When the latter finally got the better in the struggle, and became, about the middle of the fourteenth century, the national speech of all of England, it was no longer the English of King Alfred. It was a new language, a grammarless tongue, almost wholly stripped of its inflections. It had lost a half of its old words, and had filled their places with French equivalents. The Norman lawyers had introduced legal terms, the ladies and courtiers, words of dress and courtesy. The knight had imported the vocabulary of war and of the chase. The master builders of the Norman castles and cathedrals contributed technical expressions proper to the architect and the mason. The art of cooking was French. The naming of the living animals, ox, swine, sheep, deer, was left to the Saxon churl who had the herding of them, while the dressed meats, beef, pork, mutton, venison, received their baptism from the table-talk of his Norman master, 
the four orders of begging friars, and especially the Franciscans or Grey Friars, introduced into England in 1224, became intermediaries between the high and the low. They went about preaching to the poor, and in their sermons they intermingled French with English. In their hands, too, was almost all the science of the day. Their medicine, botany, and astronomy displayed the old nomenclature of leechdom, wort cunning, and starcraft. And finally, the translators of French poems often found it easier to transfer a foreign word bodily than to seek out a native synonym, particularly when the former supplied them with a rhyme. But the innovation reached even to the commonest words in everyday use, so that voice drove out stephen, poor drove out arm, and color, use, and place made good their footing beside hue, want, and stead. A great part of the English words that were left were so changed in spelling and pronunciation as to be practically new. Chaucer stands, in date, midway between King Alfred and Alfred Tennyson, but his English differs vastly more from the former's than from the latter's. To Chaucer, Anglo-Saxon was as much a dead language as it is to us. The classical Anglo-Saxon, moreover, had been the Wessex dialect, spoken and written at Alfred's capital, Winchester. When the French had displaced this as the language of culture, there was no longer a king's English or any literary standard. The sources of modern standard English are to be found in the East Midland, spoken in Lincoln, Norfolk, Suffolk, Cambridge, and the neighboring shires. Here, the old Anglian had been corrupted by the Danish settlers, and rapidly threw off its inflections when it became a spoken and no longer a written language after the conquest. The West Saxon, clinging more tenaciously to ancient forms, sunk into the position of a local dialect, while the East Midland, spreading to London, Oxford, and Cambridge, became the literary English in which Chaucer wrote. The Normans brought in, also, new intellectual influences and new forms of literature. They were a cosmopolitan people, and they connected England with the continent. Lanfranc and Anselm, the first two Norman archbishops of Canterbury, were learned and splendid prelates of a type quite unknown to the Anglo-Saxons. They introduced the scholastic philosophy taught at the University of Paris and the reformed discipline of the Norman abbeys. They bound the English church more closely to Rome and officered it with Normans. English bishops were deprived of their sees for illiteracy, and French abbots were set over monasteries of Saxon monks. Down to the middle of the fourteenth century, the learned literature of England was mostly in Latin, and the polite literature in French. English did not at any time altogether cease to be a written language, but the extant remains of the period from 1066 to 1200 are few, and with one exception, unimportant. After 1200, English came more and more into written use, but mainly in translations, paraphrases, and imitations of French works. The native genius was at school, and followed awkwardly the copy set by its master. The Anglo-Saxon poetry, for example, had been rhythmical and alliterative. It was commonly written in lines containing four rhythmical accents, and with three of the accented syllables alliterating. Reste hine tharum chewot resed chlifade, geap and gold fa gest in a swef. Rested him then the great hearted, the hall towered, roomy and gold bright, the guests slept within. This rude, energetic verse, the Saxon shop, had sung to his harp or his glee beam dwelling on the emphatic syllables, passing swiftly over the others which were of undetermined number and position in the line. It was now displaced by the smooth metrical verse with rhymed endings, which the French introduced and which our modern poets use, a verse fitted to be recited rather than sung. The old English alliterative verse continued, indeed, in occasional use to the sixteenth century, but it was linked to a forgotten literature and an obsolete dialect, and was doomed to give way. Chaucer lent his great authority to the more modern verse system, and his own literary models and inspirers were all foreign, French or Italian. Literature in England began to be once more English and truly national in the hands of Chaucer and his contemporaries, 
but it was the literature of a nation cut off from its own past by three centuries of foreign rule. The most noteworthy English document of the 11th and 12th centuries was the continuation of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. Copies of these annals, differing somewhat among themselves, have been kept at the monasteries in Winchester, Abingdon, Worcester, and elsewhere. The yearly entries were mostly brief, dry records of passing events, though occasionally they became full and animated. The Fen country of Cambridge and Lincolnshire was a region of monasteries. Here were the great abbeys of Peterborough and Croyland and Ely Minster. One of the earliest English songs tells how the savage heart of the Danish king Knut was softened by the singing of the monks in Ely. Merie sungen münches bin in Ely, the Knut können reu therbei. Rovith knitis nor the land, and here we this münches sang. It was among the dikes and marches of this fen country that the bold outlaw Herivard, the last of the English, held out for some years against the conqueror. And it was here, in the rich abbey of Burch or Peterborough, the ancient Medis Hamstede, Meadow Homestead, that the chronicle was continued for nearly a century after the conquest, breaking off abruptly in 1154, the date of King Stephen's death. Peterborough had received a new Norman abbot, Turold, a very stern man, and the entry in the chronicle for 1170 tells how Herivard and his gang, with his Danish backers, thereupon plundered the abbey of its treasures, which were first removed to Ely, and then carried off by the Danish fleet and sunk, lost, or squandered. The English in the later portions of this Peterborough chronicle becomes gradually more modern, and falls away more and more from the strict grammatical standards of the classic Anglo-Saxon. It is a most valuable historical document, and some passages of it are written with great vividness, notably the sketch of William the Conqueror put down in the year of his death, 1086, by one who had looked upon him and at another time dwelt in his court. He who was before a rich king and lord of many a land, he had not then of all his land but a piece of seven feet. Likewise, he was a very stark man and a terrible, so that one durst do nothing against his will. Among other things is not to be forgotten the good peace that he made in his land, so that a man might fare over his kingdom with his bosom full of gold unhurt. He set up a great deer preserve, and he laid laws therewith that whoso should slay hart or hind, he should be blinded. As greatly did he love the tall deer as if he were their father." With the discontinuance of the Peterborough Annals, English history written in English prose ceased for three hundred years. The thread of the nation's story was kept up in Latin chronicles, compiled by writers partly of English and partly of Norman descent. The earliest of these, such as Ordericus Vitalis, Simeon of Durham, Henry of Huntingdon, and William of Malmesbury, were contemporary with the later entries of the Saxon Chronicle. The last of them, Matthew of Westminster, finished his work in 1273. About 1300, a monk of Gloucester composed a chronicle in English verse, following in the main the authority of the Latin chronicles, and he was succeeded by other rhyming chroniclers in the 14th century. In the hands of these, the true history of the Saxon times was overlaid with an ever-increasing mass of fable and legend. All real knowledge of the period dwindled away until in Capgrave's Chronicle of England, written in prose in 1463-64, to hardly anything of it is left. In history, as in literature, the English had forgotten their past, and had turned to foreign sources. It is noteworthy that Shakespeare, who borrowed his subjects and his heroes sometimes from the authentic English history, sometimes from the legendary history of ancient Britain, Denmark, and Scotland, as in Lear, Hamlet, and Macbeth, ignores the Saxon period altogether. And Spencer, who gives in his second book of the Fairy Queen a resume of the reigns of fabulous British kings, the supposed ancestors of Queen Elizabeth, his royal patron, has nothing to say of the real kings of early England. So completely had the true record faded away, that it made no appeal to the imaginations of our most patriotic poets. The Saxon Alfred had been dethroned by the British Arthur 
and the conquered Welsh had imposed their fictitious genealogies upon the dynasty of the conquerors. In the Roman de Rue, a verse chronicle of the Dukes of Normandy, written by the Norman Wace, it is related that at the Battle of Hastings the French jongleur, Taillefer, spurred out before the van of William's army, tossing his lance in the air and chanting of Charlemagne and of Roland, of Oliver and the peers who died at Roncesvalles. This incident is prophetic of the victory which Norman song, no less than Norman arms, was to win over England. The lines which Taillefer sang were from the Chanson de Roland, the oldest and best of the French hero sagas. The heathen Northmen, who had ravaged the coasts of France in the tenth century, had become, in the course of one hundred and fifty years, completely identified with the French. They had accepted Christianity, intermarried with the native women, and forgotten their own Norse tongue. The race thus formed was the most brilliant in Europe. The warlike, adventurous spirit of the Vikings mingled in its blood with the French nimbleness of wit and fondness for display. The Normans were a nation of knights errant, with a passion for prowess and for courtesy. Their architecture was at once strong and graceful. Their women were skilled in embroidery, a splendid sample of which is preserved in the famous Bayeux Tapestry, in which the conqueror's wife Matilda and the ladies of her court wrought the history of the conquest. This national taste for decoration expressed itself not only in the ceremonious pomp of feast and chase and tourney, but likewise in literature. The most characteristic contribution of the Normans to English poetry were the metrical romances, or chivalry tales. These were sung or recited by the minstrels, who were among the retainers of every great feudal baron, or by the jongleurs, who wandered from court to castle. There is a whole literature of these romans d'aventure in the Anglo-Norman dialect of French. Many of them are very long, often thirty, forty, or fifty thousand lines written sometimes in a strophic form, sometimes in long alexandrines, but commonly in the short, eight-syllabled rhyming couplet. Numbers of them were turned into English verse in the thirteenth, fourteenth, and fifteenth centuries. The translations were usually inferior to the originals. The French trouver, finder, or poet, told in his story in a straightforward, prosaic fashion, omitting no details in the action, and unrolling endless descriptions of dresses, trappings, gardens, etc. He invented plots and situations full of fine possibilities by which later poets have profited, but his own handling of them was feeble and prolix. Yet there was a simplicity about the old French language, and a certain elegance and delicacy in the diction of the trouvère, which the rude, unformed English failed to catch. The heroes of these romances were of various climes. Guy of Warwick and Richard the Lionheart of England, Havelock the Dane, Sir Troilus of Troy, Charlemagne, and Alexander. But strangely enough, the favorite hero of English romance was that mythical Arthur of Britain, whom Welsh legend had celebrated as the most formidable enemy of the Sassanac invaders and their victor in twelve great battles. The language and literature of the ancient Simurre or Welsh, had made no impression on their Anglo-Saxon conquerors. There were a few Welsh borrowings in the English speech, such as bard and druid, but in the old Anglo-Saxon literature there are no more traces of British song and story than if the two races had been sundered by the ocean instead of being borderers for over six hundred years. But the Welsh had their own national traditions, and after the Norman conquest these were set free from the isolation of their Celtic tongue and in an indirect form entered into the general literature of Europe. The French came into contact with the old British literature in two places, in the Welsh marches in England and in the province of Brittany in France, where the population is of Cymric race and spoke, and still to some extent speaks, a Cymric dialect akin to the Welsh. About 1140, Geoffrey of Monmouth, a Benedictine monk, seemingly of Welsh descent, who lived at the court of Henry I and became afterward Bishop of St. Asaph, produced in Latin a so-called Historia Britonum, in which it was told how Brutus, the great-grandson of Aeneas, came to Britain and founded there his kingdom called after him, and his city of New Troy, Troy Novant, on the site of the later London. An air of historic gravity was given to this tissue of Welsh legends by an exact chronology and the genealogy of the British kings, 
and the author referred as his authority to an imaginary Welsh book given him, as he said, by a certain Walter, Archdeacon of Oxford. Here appeared that line of fabulous British princes which has become so familiar to modern readers in the plays of Shakespeare and the poems of Tennyson. Lear and his three daughters, Cymbeline, Gorboduc, the subject of the earliest regular English tragedy, composed by Sackville and acted in 1562. Locrine and his queen Gwendolen, and his daughter Sabrina, who gave her name to the river Severn, was made immortal by an exquisite song in Milton's Comus, and became the heroine of the tragedy of Locrine, once attributed to Shakespeare, and above all, Arthur, the son of Uther Pendragon, and the founder of the Table Round. In 1155, Waits, the author of the Roman de Roux, turned Geoffrey's work into a French poem entitled Brute d'Angleterre, Brute being a Welsh word meaning chronicle. About the year 1200, Wace's poem was Englished by Laomon, a priest of Arley Regis, on the border stream of Severn. Laomon's Brute is in 30,000 lines, partly alliterative and partly rhymed, but written in pure Saxon English with hardly any French words. The style is rude but vigorous, and at times highly imaginative. Wace had amplified Geoffrey's chronicle somewhat, but Laomon made much larger additions, derived, no doubt, from legends current on the Welsh border. In particular, the story of Arthur grew in his hands into something like fullness. He tells of the enchantments of Merlin the wizard, of the unfaithfulness of Arthur's queen, Guinevere, and the treachery of his nephew, Modred. His narration of the last great battle between Arthur and Modred, of the wounding of the king, fifteen fiendly wounds he had, one might in the least three gloves thrust, and of the little boat with two women therein, wonderly dight, which came to bear him away to Avalon and the queen Argante, sheenest of all elves, whence he shall come again, according to Merlin's prophecy, to rule the Britons. All this left little in essentials for Tennyson to add in his death of Arthur. This new material for fiction was eagerly seized upon by the Norman romancers. The story of Arthur drew to itself other stories which were afloat. Walter Mapp, a gentleman of the court of Henry the Second, in two French prose romances, connected with it the church legend of the Sangreal, or Holy Cup, from which Christ had drunk at his last supper, and which Joseph of Arimathea had afterward brought to England. Then it miraculously disappeared, and became thenceforth the occasion of knightly quest, the mystic symbol of the object of the soul's desire, an adventure only to be achieved by the maiden knight Galahad, the son of the great Lancelot, who in the romances had taken the place of Modred in Geoffrey's history, as the paramour of Queen Guinevere. In like manner the love story of Tristan and Isolde was joined by other romancers to the Arthur saga. This came probably from Brittany or Cornwall. Thus there grew up a great epic cycle of Arthurian romance, with a fixed shape and a unity and vitality which have prolonged it to our own day, and rendered it capable of a deeper and more spiritual treatment, and a more artistic handling by such modern English poets as Tennyson in his Idols of the King, by Matthew Arnold, Swinburne, and many others. There were innumerable Arthur romances in prose and verse, in Anglo-Norman and Continental French dialects, in English, in German, and in other tongues. But the final form which the saga took in medieval England was the prose Mort d'Arthur of Sir Thomas Mallory, composed at the close of the fifteenth century. This was a digest of the earlier romances and is Tennyson's main authority. Beside the literature of the night was the literature of the cloister. There is a considerable body of religious writing in early English, consisting of homilies in prose and verse, books of devotion like the Ancran Rivle, Rule of Anchoresses, 1225, the Eanbit of Inwit, Remorse of Conscience, 1340, both in prose, the Handlung Sinne, 1303, the Cursor Mundi, 1320, and the Prick of Conscience, 1340, in verse. Metrical renderings of the Psalter, the Pater Noster, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments, the Gospels for the Day, such as the Ormulum or Book of Orm, 1205, 
Legends and Miracles of Saints, Poems in Praise of Virginity, On the Contempt of the World, On the Five Joys of the Virgin, The Five Wounds of Christ, The Eleven Pains of Hell, The Seven Deadly Sins, The Fifteen Tokens of the Coming Judgment, and Dialogues Between the Soul and the Body. These were the work not only of the monks, but also of the begging friars, and in smaller part of the secular or parish clergy. They are full of the ascetic piety and superstition of the Middle Age, the childish belief in the marvelous, the allegorical interpretation of the scripture texts, the grotesque material horrors of hell with its grisly fiends, the vileness of the human body, and the loathsome details of its corruption after death. Now and then a single poem rises above the tedious and hideous barbarism of the general level of this monkish literature, either from a more intensely personal feeling in the poet, or from an occasional grace or beauty in his verse. A poem so distinguished, for example, A Louveron, A Love Council, by the Minorite friar Thomas de Hales, one stanza of which recalls the French poet Villon's Ballad of Dead Ladies with its refrain, Mais où sont les neiges d'antan? Where are the snows of yesteryear? Where is Paris and Hélène, that were in so bright and fair of blee? Amadas, Tristan, and Eden, Isolde, and Alade. Hector with his sharp mane, and Caesar rich in world's fay. They beth thee gliden out of the rain, as the shaft is of the day. A few early English poems on secular subjects are also worthy of mention, among others The Owl and the Nightingale, generally assigned to the reign of Henry the Third, 1216 to 1272, an estrif or dispute in which the owl represents the ascetic and the nightingale the aesthetic view of life. The debate is conducted with much animation and a spirited use of proverbial wisdom. The Land of Cocaigne is an amusing little poem of some two hundred lines, belonging to the class of fabliaux, short humorous tales or satirical pieces in verse. It describes a lubber land or fool's paradise, where the geese fly down all roasted on the spit, bringing garlic in the bills for their dressing and where there is a nunnery upon a river of sweet milk, and an abbey of white monks and grey, whose walls, like the hall of little King Pepin, are of pie-crust and pastry-crust, with florin cakes for the shingles and fat puddings for the pins. There are a few songs dating from about 1300, and mostly found in a single collection, Harl, Manuscript 2253 which are almost the only English verse before Chaucer that has any sweetness to a modern ear. They are written in French strophic forms in the southern dialect, and sometimes have an intermixture of French and Latin lines. They are musical, fresh, simple, and many of them are very pretty. They celebrate the gladness of spring with its cuckoos and throstlecocks, its daisies and woodruff. When the nightingale sings the woods waxen green, Leaf and grass and blossom spring in Averil I ween. And love is to be my heart gone with a spear so keen, Night and day my blood drinks my heart doth me teen. Others are love plaints to Alison, or some other lady whose name is in a note of the nightingale, whose eyes are as grey as glass, and her skin as red as rose on wrists. Some employ a burden or refrain. Blow, northern wind, blow thou me, my sweeting, blow, northern wind, blow, blow, blow. Others are touched with a light melancholy at the coming of winter. Winter wakeneth all my care, now these leaves waxeth bare. Oft I sigh and mourn as e'er, when it cometh in my thought, of this world's joy, how it goeth all to naught. Some of these poems are love songs to Christ or the Virgin, composed in the warm language of earthly passion. The sentiment of chivalry united with the ecstatic reveries of the cloister had produced mariolatry and the imagery of the Song of Solomon, in which Christ woos the soul and made his this feeling of divine love familiar. Toward the end of the thirteenth century, a collection of lives of saints, a sort of English golden legend, was prepared at the great abbey of Gloucester for use on saints' days. The legends were chosen partly from the hagiology of the Church Catholic, as the lives of Margaret, Christopher, and Michael, partly from the calendar of the English Church, as the lives of St. Thomas of Canterbury, of the Anglo-Saxons, Dunstan, Swithin, who is mentioned by Shakespeare, and Kenelm, whose life is quoted by Chaucer in the Nona Prestos tale, 
The verse was clumsy and the style monotonous, but an imaginative touch here and there has furnished a hint to later poets. Thus the legend of St. Brandon's search for the earthly paradise has been treated by Matthew Arnold and William Morris. About the middle of the fourteenth century there was a revival of the Old English alliterative verse in romances like William and the Werewolf and Sir Gawain, and in religious pieces such as Clannes, Purity, Patience, and The Pearl, the last named a mystical poem of much beauty, in which a bereaved father sees a vision of his daughter among the glorified. Some of these employed rhyme as well as alliteration. They are in the West Midland dialect, although Chaucer implies that alliteration was most common in the North. I am a southern man, says the parson in the Canterbury Tales. I cannot jest Rome ram roof by my letter. But the most important of the alliterative poems was the vision of William conquering Pierce the Plowman. In the second half of the fourteenth century, French had ceased to be the mother tongue of any considerable part of the population of England. By a statute of Edward III in 1362, it was displaced from the law courts. By 1386, English had taken its place in the schools. The Anglo-Norman dialect had grown corrupt, and Chaucer contrasts the French of Paris with the provincial French spoken by his prioress after the skull of Stratford at Bow. The native English genius was also beginning to assert itself, roused in part, perhaps, by the English victories in the wars of Edward III against the French. It was the bows of the English yeomanry that won the fight at Crecy, fully as much as the prowess of the Norman baronage. But at home the times were bad. Heavy taxes and the repeated visitations of the pestilence or black death pressed upon the poor and wasted the land. The church was corrupt, the mendicant orders had grown enormously wealthy, and the country was eaten up by a swarm of begging friars, pardoners, and apparitors. The social discontent was fermenting among the lower classes, which finally issued in the communistic uprising of the peasantry under Watt Tyler and Jack Straw. This state of things is reflected in the vision of Pierce Plowman, written as early as 1362 by William Langland, a tonsured clerk of the West Country. It is in form of an allegory, and bears some resemblance to the later and more famous allegory of the Pilgrim's Progress. The poet falls asleep on the Malvern Hills in Worcestershire, and has a vision of a fair field full of folk, representing the world with its various conditions of men. There were pilgrims and palmers, hermits with hooked staves, who went to Walsingham, and their wenches after them, great lubbers and long that were loth to work, friars glossing the gospel for their own profit, pardoners cheating the people with relics and indulgences, parish priests who forsook their parishes, that had been poor since the pestilence time, and went to London to sing there for simony, bishops, archbishops, and deacons who got themselves fat clerkships in the exchequer or king's bench, in short, all manner of lazy and corrupt ecclesiastics. A lady who represents holy church then appears to the dreamer, explaining to him the meaning of his vision, and reads to him a sermon, the text of which is, When all treasure is tried, truth is the best. A number of other allegorical figures are next introduced, conscience, reason, mead, simony, falsehood, etc. And after a series of speeches and adventures, a second vision begins, in which the seven deadly sins pass before the poet, in a succession of graphic impersonations, and finally all the characters set out on a pilgrimage in search of St. Truth, finding no guide to direct them save Pierce the Plowman, who stands for the simple, pious, laboring man, the sound heart of the English common folk. The poem was originally in eight divisions or passus, to which was added a continuation in three parts, Vita d'Auvel, d'Aubet, and du Best. About 1377 the whole was greatly enlarged by the author. Pierce Plowman was the first extended literary work after the conquest, which was purely English in character. It owed nothing to France but the allegorical cast which the Roman de la Rose had made fashionable in both countries. But even here such personified abstractions as Langland's fair speech and work when time is remind us less of the franchise, bel amour, and fal semblant of the French courtly allegories than of Bunyan's Mr. Worldly Wiseman and even of such Puritan names as Praise God Barebones and Zeal of the Land Busy, 
The poem is full of English moral seriousness, of shrewd humor, the hatred of a lie, the homely English love for reality. It has little unity of plan, but is rather a series of episodes, discourses, parables, and scenes. It is all astir with the actual life of the time. We see the gossips gathered in the alehouse of Betjen the Brewster, and the pastry cooks in the London streets crying, Hot pies, hot, good geese and grease. Go we dine, go we. Had Langland not linked his literary fortunes with an uncouth and obsolescent verse, and had he possessed a finer artistic sense and a higher poetic imagination, his book might have been, like Chaucer's, among the lasting glories of our tongue. As it is, it is forgotten by all but professional students of literature and history. Its popularity in its own day is shown by the number, number of manuscripts which are extant, and imitations such as Pierce the Plowman's Creed, 1394, and the Plowman's Tale, for a long time wrongly inserted in the Canterbury Tales. Pierce became a kind of typical figure, like the French peasant Jacques Bonhomme, and was appealed to as such by the Protestant reformers of the sixteenth century. The attack upon the growing corruptions of the Church was made more systematically, and from the standpoint of a theologian rather than of a popular moralist and satirist, by John Wycliffe, the rector of Lutterworth and professor of divinity in Balliol College, Oxford. In a series of Latin and English tracts, he made war against indulgences, pilgrimages, images, oblations, the friars, the pope, and the doctrine of transubstantiation. But his greatest service to England was his translation of the Bible, the first complete version in the mother tongue. This he made about 1380 with the help of Nicholas Hereford, and a revision of it was made by another disciple, Purvey, some ten years later. There was no knowledge of Hebrew or Greek in England at that time, and the Wycliffeite versions were made not from the original tongues, but from the Latin Vulgate. In his anxiety to make his rendering close, and mindful, perhaps, of the warning in the Apocalypse, if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. Wycliffe followed the Latin order of construction so literally as to make rather awkward English, translating, for example, quid sibi vult hoc somnium, by what to itself woldes sveven. Purvey's version was somewhat freer and more idiomatic. In the reigns of Henry the Fourth and Fifth, it was forbidden to read or to have any of Wycliffe's writings. Such of them as could be seized were publicly burned. In spite of this, copies of his Bible circulated secretly in great numbers. Forshall and Madden, in their great edition, 1850, enumerate 150 manuscripts which had been consulted by them. Later translators, like Tyndale and the makers of the Authorized Version, or King James Bible, 1611, followed Wycliffe's language in many instances, so that he was, in truth, the first author of our biblical dialect, and the founder of that great monument of noble English, which has been the main conservative influence in the mother tongue, holding it fast to many strong, pithy words and idioms that would else have been lost. In 1415, some thirty years after Wycliffe's death, by decree of the Council of Constance, his bones were dug up from the soil of Letterworth Chancel and burned, and the ashes cast into the swift. The brook, says Thomas Fuller in his church history, did convey his ashes into Avon, Avon into Severn, Severn into the narrow seas, they into the main ocean, and thus the ashes of Wycliffe are the emblem of his doctrine, which now is dispersed all the world over. Although the writings thus far mentioned are of very high interest to the student of the English language, and the historian of English manners and culture, they cannot be said to have much importance as mere literature. But in Geoffrey Chaucer, died 1400, we meet with a poet of the first rank, whose works are increasingly read, and will always continue to be a source of delight and refreshment to the general reader, as well as a well of English undefiled to the professional man of letters. With the exception of Dante, Chaucer was the greatest of the poets of medieval Europe, and he remains one of the greatest of English poets, and certainly the foremost of English storytellers in verse. He was the son of a London vintner, and was in his youth in the service of Lionel, Duke of Clarence, one of the sons of Edward the Third. He made a campaign in France, 1359-60, to 60, when he was taken prisoner. Afterward he was attached to the court and received numerous favors and appointments. He was sent on several diplomatic missions by the king, three of them to Italy, 
where in all probability he made the acquaintance of the new Italian literature, the writings of Dante, Petrarch, and Boccaccio. He was appointed at different times comptroller of the wool customs, comptroller of petty customs, and clerk of the works. He sat for Kent in Parliament, and he received pensions from three successive kings. He was a man of business as well as books, and he loved men and nature no less than study. He knew his world. He saw life steadily and saw it whole. Living at the center of English social and political life, and resorting to the court of Edward III, then the most brilliant in Europe, Chaucer was an eye-witness of those feudal pomps which filled the high-colored pages of his contemporary, the French chronicler, Froissart. His description of a tournament in the knight's tale is unexcelled for spirit and detail. He was familiar with dances, feasts, and state ceremonies, and all the life of the baronial castle, in bower and hall, the tromps with the loud minstrelsy, the heralds, the ladies, and the squires, what hawks sitting on the perch above, what hounds leggin on the floor adown. But his sympathy reached no less the life of the lowly, the poor widow in her narrow cottage, and the true sphinker and a good, the ploughman whom Langland had made the hero of his vision. He is, more than all English poets, the poet of the lusty spring, of April with her showers sweet, and of the foulest song, of May with all her flowers and her green, of the new leaves in the wood, and the meadows new powdered with the daisy, the mystic marguerite of his legend of good women. A fresh vernal air blows through all his pages. In Chaucer's earlier work, such as the translation of The Romance of the Rose, if that be his, the Book of the Duchess, the Parliament of Fowls, the House of Fame, as well as in the Legend of Good Women, which was later, the inspiration of the French court poetry of the 13th and 14th centuries is manifest. He retains in them the medieval machinery of allegories and dreams, the elaborate descriptions of palaces, temples, portraitures, etc., which had been made fashionable in France by such poems as Guillaume de Loris's Romance de la Rose and Jean Machaut's La Fontaine Amoureuse. In some of these, the influence of Italian poetry is also perceptible. There are suggestions from Dante, for example, in The Parliament of Fowls and The House of Fame, and Troilus and Cressida is a free handling rather than a translation of Focaccio's Filostrato. In all of these, there are passages of great beauty and force. Had Chaucer written nothing else, he would still have been remembered as the most accomplished English poet of his time, but he would not have risen to the rank which he now occupies as one of the greatest English poets of all time. This position he owes to his masterpiece, The Canterbury Tales. Here he abandoned the imitation of foreign models and the artificial literary fashions of his age, and wrote of real life from his own ripe knowledge of men and things. The Canterbury Tales are a collection of stories written at different times, but put together probably toward the close of his life. The framework into which they are fitted is one of the happiest ever devised. A number of pilgrims who are going on horseback to the shrine of St. Thomas a Becket at Canterbury meet at the Tabard Inn in Southwark, a suburb of London. The jolly host of the Tabard, Harry Bailey, proposes that on their way to Canterbury each of the company shall tell two tales and two more on their way back, and that the one who tells the best shall have a supper at the cost of the rest when they return to the inn. He himself accompanies them as judge and reporter. In the setting of the stories there is thus a constant feeling of movement and the air of all outdoors. The little headlinks and endlinks which bind them together give incidents of the journey and glimpses of the talk of the pilgrims, sometimes amounting, as in the prologue of the wife of Bath, to full and almost dramatic character sketches. The stories, too, are dramatically suited to the narrators. The general prologue is a series of such character sketches, the most perfect in English poetry. The portraits of the pilgrims are illuminated with the soft brilliancy and the minute loving fidelity of the miniatures in the old missals, and with the same quaint precision in traits of expression and in costume. The pilgrims are not all such as one would meet nowadays at an English inn. The presence of a knight, a squire, a yeoman archer, and especially of so many kinds of ecclesiastics, a nun, a friar, a monk, a pardoner, and a sompnor or reparator, reminds us that the England of that day must have been less like Protestant England as we know it, than like the Italy of some thirty years ago. But however the outward face of society may have changed, the Canterbury pilgrims remain, 
in Chaucer's description, living and universal types of human nature. The Canterbury Tales are twenty-four in number. There were thirty-two pilgrims, so that if finished, as designed, the whole collection would have numbered one hundred and twenty-eight stories. Chaucer is the bright, consummate flower of the English Middle Age. Like many another great poet, he put the final touch to the various literary forms that he found in cultivation. Thus, his knight's tale, based on Boccaccio's Teseide, is the best of English medieval romances. And yet the rhyme of Sir Thopas, who goes seeking an elf queen for his mate, and is encountered by the giant Sir Oliphant, burlesques these same romances with their impossible adventures and their tedious rambling descriptions. The tales of the prioress and the second nun are saints' legends. The monk's tale is a set of dry moral apologues in the manner of his contemporary, the moral gower. The stories told by the reeve, miller, friar, sompnour, shipman, and merchant belong to the class of fabliaux, a few of which existed in English, such as Dame Ceres, The Lay of the Ash, and The Land of Cocaigne, already mentioned. The nun priest's tale, likewise, which Dryden modernized with admirable humor, was of the class of fabliaux, and was suggested by a little poem in forty lines, Du Coq et Verpil, by Marie de France, a Norman poetess of the thirteenth century. It belonged, like the early English poem of the fox and the wolf, to the popular animal saga of Reynard the fox. The Franklin's tale, whose scene is Brittany, and the wife of Bath's tale, which is laid in the time of the British Arthur, belong to the class of French lay. Serious, metrical tales shorter than the romance, and of Breton origin, the best representatives of which are the elegant and graceful lays of Marie de France. Chaucer was our first great master of laughter and of tears. His serious poetry is full of the tenderest pathos. His loosest tales are delightfully humorous and lifelike. He is the kindliest of satirists. The knavery, greed, and hypocrisy of the begging friars and the sellers of indulgences are exposed by him as pitilessly as by Langland and Wycliffe, though his mood is not like theirs, one of stern moral indignation, but rather the good-natured scorn of a man of the world. His charity is broad enough to cover even the corrupt Sompnour of whom he says, and yet in sooth he was a good fellow. Whether he shared Wycliffe's opinions is unknown, but John of Gaunt, the Duke of Lancaster and father of Henry the Fourth, who was Chaucer's lifelong patron, was likewise Wycliffe's great upholder against the persecution of the bishops. It is, perhaps, not without significance that the poor parson in the Canterbury Tales, the only one of his ecclesiastical pilgrims whom Chaucer treats with respect, is suspected by the host of the tabard to be a lawler, that is, a lollard or disciple of Wycliffe, and that because he objects to the jovial innkeeper swearing by God's bones. Chaucer's English is nearly as easy for a modern reader as Shakespeare's, and few of his words have become obsolete. His verse, when rightly read, is correct and melodious. The early English was, in some respects, more sweet upon the tongue than the modern language. The vowels had their broad Italian sounds, and the speech was full of soft gutturals and vocalic syllables, like the endings in in, is, and e, which made feminine rhymes and kept the consonants from coming harshly together. Great poet as Chaucer was, he was not quite free from the literary weakness of his time. He relapses sometimes into the babbling style of the old chroniclers and legend writers, cites auctors, and gives long catalogues of names and objects with a naive display of learning, and introduces vulgar details in his most exquisite passages. There is something childish about almost all the thought and art of the Middle Ages, at least outside of Italy, where classical models and traditions never quite lost their hold. But Chaucer's artlessness is half the secret of his wonderful ease in storytelling, and is so engaging that, like a child's sweet unconsciousness, one would not wish it otherwise. The Canterbury Tales had shown of what high uses the English language was capable, but the curiously trilingual condition of literature still continued. French was spoken in the proceedings of Parliament as late as the reign of Henry the Sixth, 1422 to 1471. Chaucer's contemporary, John Gower, wrote his Vox Clementis in Latin, his Speculum Meditantis, a lost poem, and a number of ballads, in Parisian French, and his Confessio Amantis, 1393, in English. 
The last named is a dreary, pedantic work, in some fifteen thousand smooth, monotonous, eight-syllabled couplets, in which Grand Amour instructs the lover how to get the love of Belle Pousselle. End of Part 1, Chapter 1